Hello, my name is Joshua Mugabe. I welcome you to Cell Division. Our lesson objectives today are we shall look at cell cycle, interface, mitosis, stroke cytokinesis, mitotic index, cell cycle regulation, cell death, and lastly, we shall talk about cancer development. Welcome. Cell cycle. The cell cycle is an ordered set. It is an ordered set of events that culminates in the division of a cell. A cell cycle is an ordered set of events that culminates in the division of a cell. Interface. We have G1, that is for cell growth and metabolism. We have the S phase, which is DNA replication. And then we have G2, which is still the cell growth and proofreading. I want us to look at uh, this cycle here. If you look at this cycle, we have the brown part. The brown part that we have from here, here like this, and then it comes this way, all that part there, that is interface phase. And in that interface phase, we have three divisions. The first division that we have here is what we call the G1 phase, or the growth and metabolism. The cycle the cell is growing and uh, it is preparing energy. Then when it moves from G1, it moves and then goes to S phase. In the S phase, which stops here, the S phase is for replication of DNA. Here DNA is making a copy of itself. Then from the S phase, we go now to the G2 phase. The G2 phase, now this is still a growth phase and a preparation phase or a proofreading phase whereby the cell is preparing itself to start the M phase for the cell cycle. That part from G1 to S to G2, that is what we call the interphase of the cell cycle. The interface is an active period. It is an active period 
in the cell cycle when many key metabolic processes occur. Interphase is an active period in the cell cycle when many key metabolic processes occur. And these include, one, there is DNA replication. DNA replication, that is when DNA is copying itself, is making a copy of itself, that is that during the S phase, as we have seen, during the S phase. Then there is also, still in the interphase, organelles duplication. There is organelle duplication. Because the cell is going to undergo um, cell division, it prepares itself such that when the cell divides, all the cells have enough organelles that can be formed inside. So during this phase of the interface, where we have G1 and G2, the organelles are coping themselves or they are duplicating themselves. The cell grows or what we call cell growth. Now here, as the cell is growing, the cytoplasmic volume is increasing. The volume of the cell is increasing in size. Still in interface, there is transcription and translation. Here the proteins are being produced, still in the interface space. Then there is obtaining of nutrients. As the cell is preparing itself, some of the activities is to prepare enough materials which will take the cell throughout the whole process of the cycle. And these are metabolic processes that are taking place, preparing energy that will drive the cycle through the whole process. And then there is respiration. Respiration, here what is happening, ATP is needed for the division process. So it is during this process that also ATP is produced. So that's why we are saying that the interface is an active period in the cell cycle. That is when the key metabolic processes are occurring. All those metabolic processes, DNA, it's replicating, organelles are duplicating. We are seeing that uh, the organelles are becoming many. The cytoplasm is growing. There is transcription and translation, production of proteins. We have nutrients are being obtained to make sure that there are sufficient materials. There is respiration, ATP is needed for that vision. All that one takes place in the phase that we call interphase. We can use the mnemonic of Dr. DNA replicating organelles, they are duplicating, cytoplasm is growing, there is transcription and translation, uh, we are having obtaining of the nutrients, and there is also respiration to get energy. So we can use the mnemonic doctor to help us to remember the different activities or the key activities that take place during interface. As we have said, interface is an active phase of the cell with many processes occurring in a nucleus and the cytoplasm. So most of these processes that are taking place, they are taking place in the nucleus, 
and the others are taking place in the cytoplasm. DNA is replicated during the S phase. We have looked at the S phase. That is the phase in interface. When you move from G1 growth phase and metabolism phase, then you go to the second phase, which we called the S phase. And during that S phase, the DNA is replicated during the S phase. Normally, DNA is loosely packed. DNA is loosely packed as accessible chromatin within the nucleus. So what is happening because there is a replication, DNA making a copy of each cell, so it is loosely packed so that the chromatin can easily be accessible by enzymes that are going to help in the replication process. So the DNA is loosely packed during this period. That one you will find that it is uncondensed. It is not condensed, but it is uncondensed so that it can provide access to enzymes in order to help in the replication of the DNA. That is the S phase, during the S phase. The chroma, during this mitosis, DNA condenses, that is, supercoils, into tightly packaged chromosomes. That is when we are go undergoing the mitotic division. And in mitotic division, the DNA condenses. It becomes shorter and thicker. And when it becomes shorter and thicker, it means that it is tightly packed, it is condensed, it is supercoiled, and that one occurs during mitosis. Now, during the S phase, remember the S phase, this is a phase which is in the interface. The second stage in the interface, we started with the G1 phase, which is the growth and metabolism stage, where there is growth and preparation of energy. Now from there we go to the S stage or the S phase. In the S phase, that's where we are having the replication of DNA. DNA is making a copy of itself. So when you look at the replicated chromosome, the replicated chromosome will consist of genetically identical sisters or what we call identical sister chro chromatids. Now, it starts as a single it starts as a single chromatid chromosome. That is during pre-replication, before replication. The DNA appears as a single chromatid chromosome. Now, when it goes through the S phase, it makes a copy of itself. Now, they become sister chromatid chromosome that is at post replication now they are two of them they appear now two of them it has replicated it has made a copy of itself the chromosome has replicated therefore now we call it a sister chroma chromatid it is called the sister chromatid because now they are two of them. There is one and another one still attached together at the centromere. They are attached at the centromere and we refer to them as the sister chro 
chromatid chromosome. So that is what we call a replicated chromosome. It consists of genetically identical sister chromatids. Let's look at mitosis. Mitosis is a process of nuclear division whereby each of the sister chromatids are physically, physically separated into two daughter nuclei that are genetically identical. Mitosis, we are saying, is a process of nuclear division, meaning that if we have our cell, the cell is going to divide, where by each pair of sister chromatids, the sister chromatids are those ones we have seen, that which we called a DNA that has replicated itself. They are two sister chromatid attached together at the centromere. Now, these sister chromatids are going to physically be separated. They will be separated into two nuclei that are genetically identical. Now, when they separate themselves, we get two chromatids now, okay? One and another one, which were two, now become one. And this one, with this one, they are identical because they are sister cro chromatid. They are the same. So in mitosis, in this process, each pair of the sister chromatids is going to physically separate into two daughter nuclei, which are identical. Mitotic division involves four stages. It involves four stages. We have the first stage, which is prophase. Prophase, this is the first stage of uh, mitotic division which we call prophase. Here we have our chromosome, the nuclear membrane is still there, can be observed, and uh, the chromosomes have condensed, they are very small, and then it moves from prophase, it goes to another stage, which we call metaphase. Metaphase here, now the chromosomes, or sister chromatids, they align themselves at the equator on the, on the centrioles, okay? They align themselves on the centrioles on the equator. That is the meta metaphase stage. Then the third stage is the anaphase. And during the anaphase, now the sister chromatids, they separate themselves and they start moving to opposite pole, the opposite direction. The spindles will start pulling. What we had as sister chromatids, now they are separated and each of the chromosome is going to a different direction. Now the last part or the last stage is the telophase. During the telophase, now the chromosomes have reached the end of the cell. The cell divides into two, and then the chromosomes are enclosed in a nuclear membrane. And that one marks the end of mitotic division. So we are saying mitotic division involves four stages. We have prophase. Metaphase, anaphase, and telophase. 
The division of the cell occurs concurrently with the telophase. So when the cell is dividing, that process is called cytokinesis. Cytokinesis occurs in a telophase. It occurs in the telophase. Here, the cell is going to divide itself into two. The cell will divide itself into two. When the cell divides itself into two, that is what we are referring to as cytokinesis. And it occurs with the telophase. It occurs with the telophase. When telophase is taking place, still cytokinesis is also taking place at the same time. Stages of mitosis. The first stage we are looking at prophase. Now during prophase, we are saying that the DNA supercoils and the chromosomes condense. So when you look at it via a microscope, during that stage, what you are seeing here is the stage of prophase. First of all, here we have the centrioles. They are together. Then they will move to different pole. They will move to different pole. And when you look at the chromosomes inside here, they are not condensed. They are long. So what is happening here? The centrioles have already moved to different poles. And now you are seeing that your chromosomes are now condensed. They become very small and visible and condensed, and they appear to be two, like sister chromatids. When the beginning, they were just single, not yet condensed. But now here at the end, you will see that it ends up when the chromosomes have condensed the centrioles have moved to different poles and the chromosomes are visible because the DNA has supercoiled. That is the prophase stage. The nuclear membrane will break away. If you look at the first stage here, you can see that it still has the nuclear membrane around. But by the end of prophase, this nuclear membrane has broken down. This one, when you look at it, the nuclear membrane is breaking down. It is disappearing. So it is still during the prophase stage that the nuclear membrane breaks down completely. And lastly, the paired centrosomes move to the pole. We have already talked about that one, that these centrosomes will move to the different pole. So that is what is happening during prophase. In prophase, we have the DNA supercoiling, the chromosomes are becoming shorter, that we are calling condensing, the nuclear membrane will break away and the uh, it will disappear and then the centrosomes will move to the different pole or different size. The second phase is the metaphase. Now during metaphase, the microtubules or what we are calling the spindle fibers connect to the centrosome to the centromere. Now the centromere is that point between the sister chromatids. That point that you see between the sister chromatid where they join together. That point where they join together. That point there where they join together. The sister chromatids is what we call the centromere. Now 
The centrosomes are these ones at the end, which moved at the different end. Those centrosomes, they send wire-like structures, which we are seeing, these wire-like structures moving, and they go and attach themselves on the centrosome of, or they go and attach themselves on the central mayor of the sister chromatids. Those ones are the centrosomes. Spindles, sorry, they are the spindles coming from the centrosome, attaching themselves on the centromere of the sister chromatid. So that is the first part which takes place in the stage of metaphase. Then these spindles, fibers, when they have attached themselves to the different centromeres of the different sister chromatids, what they are going to do they are going to contract. And as the spindles are contracting, that means they are becoming very tight. They are going to cause the chromosomes to align at the center. All the chromosomes will align at the center. Now, when you look at these chromosomes here, there is this chromosome here, this chromosome here, this chromosome here, another one is here. They are not aligned in the center but they are attached on the spindle. So we end up going to the other side and we find that now all of them, they are aligned in the center of the nucleus because the spindles are tightening and pulling them. And when they pull them, they align them at the center of the cell. What is aligning them? They are the spindles which are pulling on the other side and another one is pulling the other side. So when they are being pulled at different sides, the older chromosomes will align themselves in the center of the cell. So that's what is happening during metaphase. During metaphase, we are saying the spindle fibers will connect from the centrosome to the centromere. Centromere those are the points where the sister chromatid attach each other. And then these spindle fibers, they are going to contract. And when they contract, they are going to cause the chromosome to align at the center. That's what happens during metaphase. Then we go to the anaphase. Anaphase, here now what is going to happen the spindle fiber contraction is going to cause the sister chromatids to separate. Contraction of the spindle fibers will cause the sister chromatids to separate. And now they will become identical chromosomes when they are at the opposite poles, when they move to the opposite pole. So we ended metaphase. When we ended metaphase, our cell, all the sister chromatids were aligned in the center. They were aligned on the spindles in the center of the cell. Now what is going to happen, the spindle fibers are going to start pulling, going to different poles. And when they pull, going to different poles, the sister chromatids are going to be separated. And when they are separated, now we are going to end up with a cell where the sister chromatids now are moving to different poles. This sister chromatid is going to this direction, and this sister chromatid is going the other direction. So that is what happens during anaphase. In anaphase, the spindle fiber contraction causes the sister chromatids that were lined up together in the center to separate. And when they separate, they move to different opposite poles. Now, the sister chromatid, each one of them turns into a chromosome. So you will find that this is sister chromatid here. This sister chromatid here is the same as his sister chromatid here. They are identical. The same applies to this one, 
is the same as this one. So they move to different poles. And when they move to different pole, now they will turn, each one will turn into a chromosome. Then we go to the last phase, which is the telophase. During the telophase, the chromosome decondense. The chromosomes are going to decondense. Now, decondensing is that they are going now to become loose. The other time they were short, condensed. They were short and visible. Now they are going to decondense, and when they decondense, they become smaller and longer. So that's what is going to happen during the stage of telophase. And then also the nuclear membrane is going to reform around the two identical chromosome sets. So what is going to happen here? Now you will see that the nuclear membrane is forming. We shall have our nuclear membrane forming around the chromosomes, you, as you are seeing. And then when you look at them, they are decondensing. Here they are condensed. They are very short. They are visible. But when you come here, now they elongate. When they elongate, now that is what we are calling decondensing. They are becoming shorter, I mean longer and then thinner. That is what we are calling decondensing. Then the cytokinesis occurs concurrently. At that same time, now what has been one cell, the one cell we have, which we started with, now this one cell that we have is going to divide itself in the middle. And that dividing in the middle is what we refer to as a cytokinesis. It is dividing itself into two. And now at the end, we are going to end up with the two cells. These two cells that we are having are a result of cytokinesis. So now we shall have two individual different cells that occurs in telophase. So in telophase, the chromosomes decondense, the nuclear membrane reforms around the identical chromosome sets, and then we end up with cytokinesis dividing the cell into two. We go to cytokinesis. We have already seen that cytokinesis is a process of cytoplasmic division whereby the cell splits into two. This one is a process of cytoplasmic division and the cell is going to split into two. Now, if we are looking at the animal cell, what happens is that we get what we call microfilaments forming a ring. For example, if you look at the middle here, you will see a ring that is forming in the center of the cell. That is a ring which we are referring to as the cleavage fallow. And that cleavage fallow is going to contract. And when it contracts, like the way we are seeing it here, contracting, it is going to divide the cell into two. So that is what we are calling as a cytokinesis. It is a process of cytoplasmic division. The cytoplasm is going to divide itself into two. We have the cytoplasm is going to be divided into two and the cell is going to be split into two. The cell will be split into two. The cell separation is centripedal. The cell separation is centripedal, meaning that it takes place in the center. Centripetal, it takes place in the 
center. It divides the cell into two. In the center, that's where the cytokinesis takes place. The separation of the cell takes place. That's why we are referring to it as a centripedal. Now, if it is a plant cell, what happens? If it is a plant cell, what is going to happen is that the vesicles will form in the center of the cell. And when they are formed in the center of the cell, they will fuse. And after fusing, they are going to form what we call the end plate. Here, what we are saying, if you look at our plant cell up here, in the middle, they are vesicles which are forming there in the middle. Those ones are vesicles. They are vesicles which are forming in the middle or in the center. And when they form in the center, those vesicles, they fuse. They are going to end up fusing together. And when they fuse together, they will form what we are calling an end plate. So what started as the uh, vesicles, they will fuse together and we shall form this uh, end plate here that is formed. So that is what happened. That's how cytokinesis occurs in plant cells. So the cell separation is centrifugal. The cell separation is centrifugal. It is occurring, condensing in the middle. It brings vesicles to form in the middle. And when those vesicles form in the middle, like here, as you are seeing them forming in the middle, the vesicles, then we end up forming what we are calling the end plate. The end plate now separates both the cells. So that's how cytokinosis takes place in the plant cell. Summary of mitotic division. So there is replication. We are having replication of the cell and this replication of the cell requires chemical instructions. Replication of the cell requires chemical instra instructions and uh, that must be stored as a code. It is going to require chemical instruction and those chemical instruction are stored as codes. Now, the DNA, DNA functions as the genetic code. It is the one which stores the chemical instruction. While the proteins, the proteins do the chemical work. The proteins do the chemical work. Proteins are the ones that are going to help in the translation of this genetic code from the DNA to give instruction to the cell to replicate, divide itself. So the proteins are the ones that are doing that work, the enzymes and so on. But the information, which is the chemical instruction, is stored as a code. And the DNA is the one that functions as the genetic code. It is the one that is storing the chemical instruction. But it is going to be helped by the proteins to do the chemical work of replication. Mitosis is the division of a cell to produce two genetically identical daughter cells. That is mitosis, the definition. It is the division of one cell. One cell is going to divide itself. And when that one cell divides itself, we shall end up getting two genetically identical sister chromatids or daughter cells. 
So from one cell, we are going to get two cells. And that one is myto mitosis. And mitosis occurs in cells that we call somatic cells. Somatic cells, these are cells of what we call the body cells. Body cells are the ones that are not involved in the formation of gametes. They are the ones that we refer to as the somatic cell. And this involves a single division, meaning that there is only one division, one cell giving us two cells. One cell giving us two cells. It divides once. So that's why we are saying it is a single division. It involves a single division. And it produces two daughter cells. It is going to produce two daughter cells. As we are seeing, this is the first cell and this one is the second cell. So it produces two daughter cells. The daughter cell are genetic clones. They are genetic clones. When we say that they are genetic clones, what we mean is that they are identical. If you look at this one, you will see that it has a blue chromosome which is long and a blue chromosome which is short. Even this one has a blue chromosome which is short and a blue chromosome which is long. And then when I look the other one, it has a purple chromosome which is long and a purple chromosome which is short. This one also has a purple chromosome which is long and a purple chromosome which is short. So when you look at them, they are genetically identical. These two daughter cells are genetically identical. And that is what we are calling genetic clones. The daughter cells are genetic clones. We go to the definition still. So when you look, that is the interface. From the interface, we go to the prophase, condensed, prophase, metaphase, they align themselves on the spindle. Anaphase, they go to different poles. And when telophase, they form two cells and then cytokinesis takes place. The cell divides into two. So that is what happens during cell division. Identifying mitotic phases. We want to identify mitotic phases. The identification of the phases of mitosis in cell viewed with a microscope or in a micrography. So we want to look at these diagrams here and we'll see if we can identify them. So if you look at them, what are you seeing? So you will see that here, the cells are in the interface stage. They are in the interface stage. And during the interface stage, this is a preparation phase that you still recall, which we talked about, where we have the growth, G1, the replication of DNA, the S phase, and the growth and proofreading stage, which we called the G2 phase. That is during the interface. So when you look at the nucleus, you will see that everything is not visible. So what is taking place in the cell is preparation during that phase. And that phase is called interface. When we move from that phase, we go to the first phase, which we call prophase. Now, during prophase, when you look at the nucleus, still you will see, you cannot see very well, but at least now you can see there is some activity in the nucleus taking place. You can see the chromosomes, chromatins, but they are not very clear very well. Then you can see the nuclear membrane is starting to disappear. 
it is giving way. That is during the prophase. Now, when we come to metaphase, now here at metaphase, now we can see clearly that you can see in the center, you can see the chromosome. Sister chromatids are aligning themselves at the center of the nucleus. That is in meta metaphase. Now, when we go to anaphase, now in anaphase, all of us now can see that the spindles are now contracting. And because they are contracting, you can see that they are pulling the sister chromatids to different poles. Some of them are going to the other side and the others are going to the opposite pole. That is during anaphase. Then the last stage, which is the telo, telophase. In telophase, now you can see that the chromosomes have reached the end. They have reached the end of the cell. These ones are this side. And now we can see that in the center of the cell, cytokinesis is starting to form. The other chromosome at the other side and other chromosomes are on the lower side. That is the identifying of mitotic phases by using a micrograph or seeing them under a microscope. That's what you're going to see. Let's now look at the mitotic index. Mitotic index from a micrograph. What is mitotic index? Mitotic index, this is the number of cells in the stage of mitosis over the total number of cells. That is what we are calling mitotic index. If you look at our diagram here, it is showing the different types of cells. It is showing the different cells, and those cells are undergoing what we are calling mitotic division. Very many cells undergoing mitosis. Now, those cells, when you look at them, you identify, can you see the cells which are undergoing mitosis? And if you see those cells that are undergoing cell division, you count them. How many are they that you are seeing that they are undergoing mitosis? You can try to look at them and then you see, you can say that this one, I can see it is under mitosis. This one is under mitosis. I can see this one is undergoing mitosis. This one, this one. So you count those cells that are in the process of mitosis. You put them up here. Then now you count the total number of cells. You count all the cells. You come and count all the cells. How many cells do we have in total? Now, when you get the whole total number of all the cells that we have, you come and put the total number of cells down. The figure that you get out is what we call the mitotic index. The number of cells that are in the process of mitosis over the total number of cells that are being seen. So can you identify the cells with visible chromosomes? Can you identify the cells with the visible chromosomes of mitosis? Now, when you look here, those ones that are labeled in green, they are the ones that are undergoing mito mitosis. So when we count them, if we try to count them, this is one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen, seventeen, eighteen, nineteen, twenty. So you will see. That those ones that are in mitosis, they are 20 in number. So now you start your calculations. The cells that are undergoing mitosis, we have the number as 20. Uh -huh. And then what is the total number? You can find out that the total number is 70, 75. And now we can now calculate our mitotic index. 
We know that the mitotic index is the number of cells that are in mitosis, which are 20. So we shall divide them with the total number of cells that we can see. So the mitotic index will be 20 divided by 75, which is going to give us 0 0.267. That is now our mitotic index. So that's how we calculate the mitotic index. You look at the micrograph and then you look for the cells that are in mitosis process. You count them and then you divide them by the total number of cells that you are seeing. Then you get your mitotic index. Functions of mitotic division. What are the functions of mitotic division? We say that there are four key reasons why cells might be required to divide mitotically. There are four key reasons why cells might divide mitotically. The first one is for tissue repair. Tissue repair. Here we are looking at the damaged or egged cells. Those ones need to be replaced by new cells. So the cells become old. Sometimes they get damaged. And when they are damaged, we replace them with new cells. And that is what we are referring to as tissue repair. The TD, we need to repair the tissue. Therefore, the cells have to undergo mitosis. Secondly, organism growth. Organism growth. In organism growth, the cellular organism can make addition cells. They can make addition cells, meaning that being multicellular, the organism keeps on growing. And growth means that you have to add on more cell. Therefore, if you are to add on more cell and to grow, the organism is growing, it means that the number of cells are increasing. Therefore, that one is the one which requires cells to divide mitoti, mitotically because the organism has to grow. Another one is asexual reproduction. Now, in asexual reproduction, this is used for natural cloning, natural cloning or what we call vegetative propagation. For example, when we are planting plants using parts of the plant, you get a stem, cut the stem, and then you plant it. It turns into a new plant. That new plant which is going to divide, to grow, is going to grow by what we call asexual reproduction. It is a sexual reproduction because there is no formation of gametes. And that one means that there is need of mitotic division to take place so that the plant can grow and increase in number. And that one is what we are referring to as vegetative propagation. So mitotic division is important in a sexual reproduction. Another one is the development of the embryo. So the zygote divides and after dividing, it differentiates to form what we call embryo. So when you have the zygote which is formed, it has to divide. And when it divides, it forms very many other cells, which cells will let alone differentiate and when they differentiate now we have formed our embryo so mitotic division is very important in the development of the embryos otherwise if it was not there then we would have remained with only a zygote and the zygote would not have developed into an embryo and when an embryo is going to develop into an organism so mitotic division is really important 
in the development of embryos. We go to cell cycle regulation. Now, cell cycle checkpoints are used. We have what we call checkpoints are used, and these ones are used to regulate the progression of a typical cell cycle. Of course, when the, cycle, the, cell, the cell are dividing, there has to be checkpoints to check whether the process is proceeding properly as it is supposed to do. So those are the cell cycle regulation, to regulate. So we want to look at those regulations. We have different checkpoints. If you look at the first phase, remember the first phase we said it is the G1 phase. During the G1 phase, as it is taking place, what is happening in the cell is during that interface say, phase, the cell is growing and preparing energy. A lot of things are preparing energy there, preparing resources, nutrients. So we need to get a check. And that check we get is this check here, G1. This check here is going to check what is everything taking place properly so when it comes at this point here there is a check here this check is checking whether daily everything is going properly that one takes place in g1 and here in checkpoint one it is ensuring that the cell is well prepared to go to the next stage for the replication of DNA, that is in the S phase. So we are moving from the G1 phase, we are going to enter into the S phase. But before we enter the S phase, the cell should prepare itself, prepare enough energy, prepare the enzymes that are going to help the cell in the S phase. Now, during the S phase here, what is taking place in the S phase is the replication of the DNA. The DNA is making a copy of itself. But for the DNA to replicate, the preparation starts from G1, growth and metabolism. Cells are mature. The cells have prepared enough food, food materials, enough energy, enough organelles have been made so the cell is preparing for the replication of the dna so that's why we have this checkpoint here the g1 check point to make sure that everything is taking place very well in the g1 before we cross to go to the s phase the next phase is the G2 phase. The G2 phase is up here. Our G2 phase is up here. That point there, here, this point here is the G2 phase. Here, that point here is the G2 phase. And this one controls mechanism. It controls mechanism to ensure the cell is prepared for mitosis. At that point, we are in G2. What is taking place here in G2? In G2, the cell is growing. Replication is finished. The cell, there is proofreading. Are we having enough number of chromosomes? Are they the real ones that we have, are we prepared to go to the M phase so that we can start the process of the mitosis? So we have to get that check at that point so that we can check that before we go to the M phase, everything is prepared for mitosis to proceed properly. That is the G2 check. 
it controls all the mechanism to make sure that the cell is prepared for mitosis. Then we have the M check. The M check is here. That is our M check. And this one, it ensures that the cell is ready for kinesis. The cell is ready for kinesis. The cell has gone through the process of mitosis. It has gone through the process of from interphase, it has gone through prophase, it has gone through metaphase, it has gone through anaphase. Now it is in the last, pre, uh, the last stage of telophase. We are going to divide now the cell. The cells have divided themselves. It is checking. Have they distributed the chromosomes, the chromatid equally? Is, it, is there any nanny disjuncture at that point? It is checking that there is no nanny disjunction. That is at the M checkpoint to make sure that the cell is ready for kinesis or dividing the cell equally between the sister cells. Now, we have another checkpoint, which is the GO. The GO is around here when we are coming from the G1 phase. Now, some cells, they enter what we call the quiescent phase. They enter what we refer to as the quiescent phase. This is the phase whereby they are just going now to rest. They are not going to go under the process of cell division. So they are just moving to the resting phase. They are going to rest. That is the GO phase or checkpoint. Cyclines. What are cyclines? Now, cyclines, it is a family of regulator load proteins. These are regulator load proteins that control the cell cycle progression. Cyclines, they are proteins that are going to regulate or to control cell division. Cell division should not continue throughout. There is a time when cell division is there, a cell is supposed to, to, to undergo cell division, and it has a time when it is supposed to rest. So there has to be certain proteins, and those proteins must control the cell, that now it is time for division, that now it is time for resting. Those cells, or those uh, proteins, are the ones that we call the cyclines. The cyclines are the regulatory proteins that control the cell cycle progression. The cycline active, they activate, the cyclines activate the cycline dependent kinesis. They activate the cycline dependent kinesis by forming a complex, by forming a core, a complex. So the cycling, these regulatory proteins, they are going to activate an enzyme which is referred to as cycling dependent kinesis, CDKs. And when it is activated, it is the one now which is going to provide energy to another target protein which is going to give a signal to the cells to start dividing. So here, if we look here, we have our cycline here. And we have the cycline dependent kinesis here. So this one depends on the cycline. And when the cycline comes and attaches itself to the cycline dependent kinesis, it activates it. And when it activates the cycling-dependent kinesis, the cycling-dependent kinesis 
will forcefully let it will give energy to a certain protein a target protein it forcefully let this uh, protein here this protein was inactive but now the cycling dependent kinases after forming a complex with the cycling it activates the inactive protein and when it activates the inactive protein now the inactive protein becomes active and now it goes to signal to the cell to start the process of the cycle now when the process is over the cycle process is over there is going to be the degradation of the cycling the cycling will be degraded and when it is degraded it means that now the cycling dependent kinases no longer can no longer form a complex and it can no longer phosphorylate a target protein to go and signal to the cell to start dividing so those are the cycling they, they are family of regulatory proteins that control cell cycle progression this cycling what they do for them they activate an enzyme cycling dependent kinesis which phosphorylates a protein which activates a, a protein which is inactive and that protein goes and activates the cell cycle progression and if the cell cycle progression is complete now the cycling will disintegrate or degrade be degraded degraded and when they are degraded that means the cycling dependent kinesis is no longer forming any complex therefore it cannot phosphorylate the proteins to go and signal to the cells to undergo cell division cycling the complex phosphorylates the target protein the complex that we were saying here this complex here when it is formed it phosphorylates a target proteins to trigger a cell cycle event so when the protein is activated this protein now will go and trigger a cell cycle event and after the event has occurred the cycling is degraded and when it is degraded that means the cdk or cycling dependent kinesis is now inactive inactivated so that is now when the event has taken place the event has taken place cell cycle has finished now the cycling is going to be degra degraded and when it is degraded that means that now our cdk is going to become inactivated cell death now cells have a limited proliferative capacity after which division will stop so here what we are saying that the cells will undergo the process of cell division they divide and divide and divide but time is going to reach when they will stop have to stop that process of division and that is what we are referring to as a hay flick limit they undergo through the hay flick limit the cells have to be stopped now stop that is your time you have worked enough stop your capacity is over that capacity of divide dividing or what we are calling proliferative capacity so what happens is that the cell enters a process which we call senescence senescence is the aging phase and this aging phase of course is going to lead to eventual cellular death 
the cell is going to die because now the cell is very old. It has entered the sense sense H. It can no longer be allowed to undergo cell division. Otherwise, it may produce cells that are not stable. So the cell death can either be uncontrolled. Cell death can either be uncontrolled, and that one we call it necrosis, or it can be a programmed death, which we call apoptosis. So when the cells are dying, it can be either uncontrolled death, which is necrosis, or it can be a programmed death, which is apoptosis. Now let us look at apoptosis. Apoptosis is a programmed death, so it is also called cell suicide. Apoptosis is a controlled destruction of a cell in response to a molecular signal. So there is a signal which is given out that this cell needs to stop. It has to be controlled and that cell is undergoing destruction. And that is what we are calling a programmed death, apoptosis or what we call cell suicide. And this even involves mitochondrial proteins. Proteins, they are proteins which are going to use energy and they're the ones that are going to carry out this one. So what happens, the cell contents are going to be packaged. They will be packaged in vesicles and they will be recycled by the body. So all the content in the cell is collected and packaged into vesicles. And these vesicles will take the content for recycling to be used by the body for other activities before the cell is destroyed. So an example here, we have our cell here ready to be destroyed. It is ready to undergo apoptosis. So what happens is that the cell content are going to be packed and when they are packaged, they will be recycled and then the cell will start dying. Cells will start dying out. That is what we call senescence stage or senescence phase. Necrosis. This is called cell homicide. It is cell homicide. Uncontrolled death, not programmed. It is the premature death of a cell. The cell it was still active, but it dies when it has not reached its stage of death. That's what we are calling premature death of a cell. And this might be due to either injury or nutrition deprivation. The cell has been injured or the cells are not receiving enough nutrients. That one will result in a premature death of the cell. The cell becomes destabilized. It becomes destabilized and it lyses. No nutrient being provided. All the cells have been injured. And when they are injured, they become destabilized. And when they are destabilized, they are going to end up dying. So the cell content are released into the tissue. So here you find that there is no packaging of the cell content because this is not programmed. The cells are injured. They are premature. They are dying prematurely, injured. And when they are injured, their content now is going to be released in the nearby tissue. And when the content of the cells are released in the nearby tissue, now that is when we get what we call inflammation inflammation so the cells have been injured and when they are injured their content is released in the tissue nearby 
And when they are released in the tissue nearby, they cause what we are calling the inflammation. They affect the cells that are around, which is going to cause the death of the cells that are nearby. Well, as when we saw in apoptosis, it is programmed. Before the cells are killed, they first pack their content in vessels. And those vessels will be taken and recycled and used by the body. But this one, necrosis, it is not programmed. It just occurs when there is an injury, when there is a deprivation of nutrition, and the cell becomes destabilized, they end up bursting. And when they burst, they are dead. And when they burst, they release their content to the nearby cells. And when they release the nearby cells, also the nearby cells are going to be affected. And that one is what we call inflammation. Uh, let's now talk about cancer. Cancer is caused by uncontrolled cell division. Cancer is caused by uncontrolled cell division and can occur in any tissue or organ. So we have what we call the tumors. We have what we call the primary tumors. These ones, they remain in the originating tissues where the cancerous cells are or the cells division is taking, uncontrolled cell division is taking place. There is increase in the number of cells and as the cells are increasing and they are not controlled, they end up causing what we call a tumor. It is called a primary tumor if it remains in the originating tissues. And that is what we call burning growth. Cells are dividing, but the division of cells in uncontrolled and this results into a tumor but if it remains in that region or that tissue where it has started from then that one is the one that we call the primary tumor or the burning growth Secondary tumors, this is where there is invading of the neighboring tissues. Here, it started from one place and then now it moves from that place and it goes and affect the neighboring tissues. That tumor now will be called the secondary tumor. And it is what we call the malignant growth. It's what we call the malignant growth. So the tumors can be primary. That is if the cells that are dividing uncontrollably, they remain in the same place where they are that one we shall call it a primary tumor but if they move from one place where they started from they originated from and go to another place or the neighboring tissues neighboring organs then that one is called a secondary tumor or what we call malignant growth metastasis this is the spread of the cancerous tissue from one location to another the one that we have been referring to as the secondary tumor or the malignant tumor if it is 
started from one place and it spreads to other places, then it is called secondary tumor or malignant growth. It's what we are referring to as metastasis. It is the spreading of the cancerous tissues from one location to another. Secondary tumors are defined and treated according to the original cell type. So the secondary tumors, we shall define them according to the origin, where they came from. For example, if it is the breast cancer and it spreads and goes to the liver, then it will be referred to as secondary breast cancer of the liver. It is identified by its origin. It originated from the breasts and it spread to the liver. So it is secondary. This is its second place. So we shall call it the secondary breast cancer of the liver. Now we want to look at the mutagens. A mutagen is an agent or an agent that causes a change in the genetic material of an organism. Any substance that is going to cause a change in the genetic material of an organism is referred to as a mutagen. Mutagens, ocogenes, and metastasis, these ones are involved in the primary and secondary tumors. We are seeing that a mutagen is an agent that causes a change in the genetic material. So if you get a mutagen, the ocogen, and metastasis, the spreading of the cancerous tissues, these ones are involved in the development of the primary and the secondary tumors. The mutagen can lead to the formation of cancer and further are called carcinogens. Those agents that lead to the formation of cancer, we refer to them as carcinogens. It can be through radiation, for example, ultraviolet light. Ultraviolet light now is a mutagen, is an agent of cancer. Other radiations can be got from X-rays. They can also cause cancer. Then we have also the chemicals. They can be mutagens, chemicals in processed foods, in cleaning products, chemicals in cigarettes. All those ones are mutagens, or we'll call them carcinogens. Then they can be from infectious agents like the bacteria or it can be also the viruses. So if those are the sources of the cancer, formation of cancer, then we refer to them as mutagen or carcinogens. What are ocogenes? An ocogen is a gene that has the potential to cause cancer. <clears throat> Excuse me. An ocogen is a gene that has the potential to cause cancers. Cancer may be caused by mutation 
of two basic classes of genes. So we are saying that cancer may be coming from uncontrolled cell division. When the cells are dividing uncontrollably, they are not controlled and they continue dividing, they may end up becoming cancerous. But they are causes, those causes, we have called them mutagen or carcinogen. And there can be also genes. These genes that may have the potential of causing cancer, these genes, we refer to them as oncogenes. They have the potential to cause cancer. And these genes, they are basically of two types. We have what we call the proto-oncogenes. Proto-oncogenes. These ones, they code for proteins that promote cell growth and proliferation. Proto-oncogenes, they code for proteins that promote cell growth and proliferation which means that they are supporting cell division. That is, those are the proto-oncogenes. They are proteins that are promoting cell growth, and cell growth is brought about by cell div division and proliferation. Then we have another set of genes. They are the tumor suppressor genes. These ones, they code for proteins that repress cell cycle progression. These ones, they suppress or they prevent cell division from proceeding or from continuing. So we have two types of cells. We have the oncogenes, proto-oncogenes. These ones promote cell growth and proliferation and then we have the tumor suppressor genes these ones they stop cell cycle progression or they try to prevent cell division when the protogenes protocol genes when they are mutated they become cancer causing oncogenes. We are seeing that the protogen, proto-oncogenes, these cells, they promote cell division or cell growth. And the cell grows by dividing. But the cell growth has to be controlled. So if the protocogenes are mutated, they are changed. They can now cause what we call cancer. Because now they will not be controlled. They will be promoting and promoting cell division and proliferation. That is when they are damaged. Then when it comes to the tumor suppressor genes, these ones sometimes are referred to as anti genes as they normally function to prevent the occurrence of cancer. So they promote apoptosins. So we have seen that the tumor suppressor genes, for them, they try to control cell growth by stopping cells from dividing. So we refer to them as anti oncogenes because oncogenes they promote cell division, but the suppressor genes, they prevent cell division. So they are anti oncogene genes. 
and they prevent the occurrence of cancer. So smoking has been one of the carcinogens that have been identified that cause cancer. And there is a positive correlation between smoking and the incidences of lung cancer. So cigarettes are mutagens. They are some of the agents that cause cancer. And it has been observed that smoking can lead to cancer. For example, if you look at our graph here, it is showing the incidence of cancer in every 100,000 men, looking at the number of cigarettes they take per day. So as the number of cigarettes taken by day increases, the incidence of getting cancer also goes on increasing. So which means that if a person takes 10 cigarettes, is at risk of getting cancer. But again, if a person takes like 30 cigarettes a day, he has a higher chances of getting cancer compared to a person who is taking 10. He also has a lower chance of, of getting cancer, but all of them, they have that chance of getting cancer. But the incidence is higher in a person who is taking more cigarettes in a day. He has a higher risk of getting the cancer. So there is a correlation, there is a relationship between smoking and lung cancer. It is found out that the people who take more cigarettes per day, they are more susceptible to having, they have higher chances of having lung cancer. Hello, thank you very much for participating in cell division. We have looked at the cell cycle. We have talked about interface. We looked at mitosis and cytokinesis. We talked about mitotic index. We looked at the cell cycle regulation, cell death, and cancer development. Thank you for participating. Don't forget to subscribe. Bye.